Good evening, I'm Amna Nawaz. And I'm Jeff Bennett. On the news hour tonight, Ukraine's president makes his case to Congress for more funding as soldiers persevere through brutal winter warfare. President Biden warns Israel is losing support. The same day, a majority of United Nations member states call for a ceasefire in Gaza. And an investigation into China's global fishing fleet exposes how seafood that's sold in the U.S. is caught and processed using forced labor. There's a huge state-run labor transfer program with thousands of Uyghurs that are forcibly removed from this inland province, Xinjiang, and transported 2,000 miles away to the other side of the country to work in the factories. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions and friends of the NewsHour, including Kathy and Paul Anderson and Camilla and George Smith. Pediatric surgeon, volunteer, topiary artist, a Raymond James financial advisor, Taylor's advice to help you live your life. Life well planned. Actually, you don't need vision to do most things in life. But it's exciting to be part of a team driving the technology forward. I think that's the most rewarding thing. People who know, know BDO. The John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, fostering informed and engaged communities. More at kf.org. and with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the news hour. <clears throat> A harsh winter has descended on Ukraine as the war nears its third year, and Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky is here in Washington urging Congress to unfreeze badly needed military aid. That debate over aid comes as a declassified U.S. intelligence assessment details staggering losses for Russia, nearly 90 percent of its pre-war force either killed or wounded in Ukraine. Lisa Desjardins on Capitol Hill and begins our coverage. A president at war flanked by Democratic and Republican leaders. What does it mean if you don't get aid by the end of the year? For Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky, this third trip to Washington after the Russian invasion has been the most complicated, as Congress has slowed down talks over whether to send him help. He met with nearly all U.S. senators in the morning. It was a very powerful meeting. President Zelensky made it so clear how he needs help but if he gets the help, he can win this war. Though a different message from House Republicans, Speaker Mike Johnson, uh, but not his full conference, met with Zelensky. What the Biden administration seems to be asking for is billions of additional dollars with no appropriate oversight, no clear strategy to win, and, and none of the answers that I think the American people are owed. Zelensky's trip comes as Congress is divided over President Biden's request for an additional $110 billion. That would include some $61 billion in aid for Ukraine, about $14 billion each for Israel and border security, and more than $9 billion for humanitarian aid. Senators told us Zelensky was powerful and impressive, but for Senate Republicans, that's not the issue. Migrant crossings into the U.S. continue to set new records, hitting more than 10,000 apprehensions per day by Border Patrol in the past few weeks. Republicans say until there are significant policy changes like dramatically curbing asylum and parole, they will not approve money for Ukraine. An investment of U.S. dollars into Ukraine's defense is a good investment. But it doesn't change the context, it doesn't change the criteria for me, and that is we have to defend ourselves first, and we can demonstrate that by securing the southern border. All 
All this comes as Ukraine's months-long counteroffensive that began in June is frozen in place as winter descends. And a new U.S. assessment says Russia believes a military deadlock through the winter would drain Western support for Ukraine and advantage Moscow. Democrats on Capitol Hill are the Ukraine hawks and warning that time is running out with Congress scheduled to recess for the holidays later this week. We stand ready and willing to engage on these topics and to provide assistance. Um, but uh, we also understand uh, the timeline ahead of us. Uh, the, the calendar is, uh, is a concern. And I'm willing to do significantly more. President Biden has signaled he's willing to tighten border laws, but Democrats and Republicans are far apart on a possible deal. Now Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell is openly saying Biden must personally get involved. Welcome back. Which made his meeting with Zelensky this afternoon a potential pivot point. We want to see Ukraine win the war. And uh, as I've said before, winning means Ukraine is a sovereign, independent nation and uh, that can afford to defend itself today and deter further aggression. Putin wants, wants a prolonged war. We dream of a Christmas in a peacetime, of course, and we are working to turn our battlefield success into peace. Ukraine and those near it are waiting to see what the White House and Congress do next. And Lisa joins us now from Capitol Hill. Laura Brown Lopez is here with me in studio, and Nick Schifrin is at the White House. Nick, you were at that press conference there at the White House. As Lisa just reported, President Zelensky made a passionate, powerful case for continued support. What's the context we need to understand here for that message he's delivering? Omna, it's a bit of a Hail Mary, uh, because as Lisa reported, without significant border concessions, Congress is not going to pass the tens of billions of dollars that Ukraine needs. At least they won't pass it right now. And Ukraine is also concerned that Hungary is on the verge this week of blocking tens of billions of dollars of European aid. And for Ukraine, uh, Ukraine says that both of those packages are the difference between victory and defeat. And what does that mean? Ukraine thinks that without that money, it'll run out of air defense that prevents Russian jets from flying all over the country. It's concerned that it won't ever get enough long-range missiles to threaten uh, Russian-occupied Crimea, which Zelensky said today uh, was one of the ways Ukraine could win the war. And Ukraine is concerned that it won't be able to pay its bills. Uh, its government needs $4 billion a month just to pay its bills. Samantha Power, USA director, today said that without ongoing economic assistance, Putin can win the war without Russian forces firing another shot. Uh, that said, Amna, it's important to note that the Pentagon says it still has $900 million worth of funds that it could use to replenish for weapons that it can still send to Ukraine today, even if Congress doesn't pass that aid. Laura, you know a number of foreign leaders come to visit Washington. President Biden doesn't always host a joint press conference like the one today. What does this moment, this war, and also the threat of no more aid for Ukraine mean for President Biden? It's a big deal for the president, Amna. I mean, the, the president, as well as the White House, has made clear time and time again that if additional funding is not passed by Congress, then the money that they ha currently have allocated for Ukraine it runs out at the end of the year. And aides inside the White House are definitely frustrated. That's what I've been hearing from them. Uh, they essentially are saying that, you know, the president's key foreign policy mission of keeping NATO unified in the face of Russian aggression is at stake here. And also, the president has promised um, that he is someone who can maintain U.S. leadership on the world stage. He can combat autocracies and authoritarianism. And if if this doesn't happen, if this doesn't pass, then it's much more difficult to keep allies united on that front. Another big thing, Amna, is that President Biden is trying to make this argument alongside the Ukrainian president, this pressure campaign on Congress. And the two big messages from him are, Putin won't stop there, won't stop here. We heard him say that tonight. Uh, he won't stop at Ukraine, as well as helping an ally without having to commit U.S. troops. Uh, helping an ally degrade the military of one of the biggest adversaries, that is Russia, should be a key national security priority for the United States. And you heard him say that he would hope that Republicans would not listen, uh, would not align themselves with Russia and the propaganda that is coming out of Russia. So, Lisa, take us inside Capitol Hill now. Republicans were there. They personally heard those pleas from President Zelensky. Are their demands on border policy still the same? 
People should understand all of the big negotiations we have on the Hill. Think about the Affordable Care Act. Think about the debt ceiling. That's what's happening right now on Capitol Hill. Republicans, no, they are not changing their position. They point to the border. They say all of those apprehensions, those border numbers, those encounters, they feel like they are in the right here. They also feel like they have the momentum because President Biden has said that he is willing to make concessions. So then you bring all of that down and you look at what exactly Republicans are asking, though. That's where we've got some issues with Democrats. Let's look at three things that they're asking for, for example. First, on asylum. Republicans would like to block, in fact, most, many at least, asylum seekers from entering this country, especially those from South and Central America. They would like to make expedited removal a national program, meaning that some uh, immigration officers could challenge almost anyone in this country. And if they weren't documented, felt like they were undocumented, they could expedite removal. And then also, they would like to limit uh, different types of parole, including her humanitarian parole. Now, some of those programs, Democrats think, could be adjusted. But they are worried that what Republicans are proposing here could lead to a national dragnet that could sweep up people who have legitimate claims and even have legal status in this country. So that's where those talks are right now. Delisa, where do negotiations go from here? What happens next? All of this, the Ukraine aid, Israel aid, and the border talks are really just hanging on the edge of a knife right now, Amna. But tonight, there is a very slight reason for hope. I just came from a meeting with DHS Secretary Mayorkas behind closed doors with three senators, a Republican Jim Langford of Oklahoma, and then independent Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, and Chris Murphy of Connecticut, the Democrat, as well as staffers. The White House getting involved. Kirsten Sinema walked out of that meeting and told me that they did make substantive progress. We all have heard that before. But there is hope that they can do this. They are running out of time. No one can get to an airport more quickly than a member of Congress before a holiday recess. Senator Schumer has asked uh, leaders to stay in town. But right now, I've got to tell you, the entire House of Representatives is getting to leave on Thursday. This next day will be critical to see if a deal can be made or not. Laura, what about other Democrats? What kind of pressure are they putting on the White House right now as the White House gets more involved in these talks? And where do the American people stand on this issue of more aid for Ukraine? Democrats are putting a lot of pressure on the White House right now. They're very concerned. Based on what uh, Lisa just outlined, those severe restrictions to asylum, to the parole systems that Republicans are proposing, that the White House may concede on that. They're hearing that the White House is open to things like that, and they don't want that to happen, so they're going to be applying a lot of pressure on the president. Democrats are going to, in coming days, be talking a lot more about this, holding press conferences. Um, but w as for where voters stand, Amna, we have a new NewsHour NPR Maris poll that will be released tomorrow. And we asked voters if they believe the U.S. should authorize additional funding to support both Ukraine and Israel. A total of 32 percent said yes. That's 41 percent Democrats. 26 percent of Republicans uh, are saying more support and 32 percent of independents. And then for those that uh, believe that the U.S. should not authorize additional funding for either war, a total of 36 percent, 24 percent of Democrats, 39 percent of Republicans, and 38 percent of independents. So in total, our poll found that 48 percent of Americans support giving additional aid to Ukraine. But you see that there's not a lot of support there among Republicans in particular. One thing uh, that is kind of key context there, Amna, and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has said himself that support among Republicans has gone down because of the rhetoric from former President Donald Trump. Nick, when you look at where the war is right now, a war you've spent so much time covering on the ground as well, the head of the Ukrainian military is now calling the war a stalemate. What does that mean for U.S. policy? Well, publicly, Amna, uh, the administration says that there's no plan B, and President Biden reiterated his definition of victory today. Uh, but senior U.S. officials are beginning to say that if, if U.S. support continues, what they want to see in 2024 is Ukraine holding the line, even if, as you say, that that means a stalemate on the front, and that by the end of 2024, U.S., European, Ukrainian domestic arms production could come online to the point where, believe it or not, Ukraine could go back on the counteroffensive in 2025. Uh, but that assumes, of course, Biden wins re-election. It also assumes, Amna, that in 2025, Ukraine can do more with those new weapons that it hasn't already done with $110 billion of aid, and neither Ukrainian nor U.S. officials have explained that yet. Nick Schifrin at the White House, Lisa Desjardins on Capitol Hill, Laura Brown lopez here with me in studio. Thank you to you all.
The United Nations General Assembly has overwhelmingly approved a measure calling for a humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. The U.S. was one of ten nations to vote against the non-binding resolution. Before today's vote, President Joe Biden said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu needs to change his hardline government, adding that Israel is losing global support due to what he called its indiscriminate bombing in Gaza. President Biden's off-camera remarks to Democratic donors in Washington today are the latest sign of increasing U.S. concern about Israel's bombing campaign in Gaza, which has killed thousands of Palestinian civilians. Bibi's got a tough decision to make, the president said of Israel's prime minister. This is the most conservative government in Israel's history, said Mr. Biden, adding that the Netanyahu-led coalition doesn't want a two-state solution, Washington's preferred outcome after the war with Hamas. The president also said Israel is starting to lose support around the world, saying of Netanyahu, I think he has to change, and with this government, this government in Israel is making it very difficult for him to move. Earlier today, Netanyahu said Israel enjoys U.S. support for its goal of destroying Hamas, while he acknowledged differing views about a plan for after the war. Can Yes, there are disputes about the day after Hamas, and I hope we will reach an agreement here as well. I will not allow that after the great sacrifice of our citizens and fighters, we bring into Gaza those who teach terrorism, support terrorism, finance terrorism. It all comes as Israel's siege on Gaza today continued in all directions. The world's conscience is dead. No humanity or any kind of morals. From the north, Israeli soldiers pushed their ground invasion further into the Gaza Strip. As hospitals struggle to keep up with the injured and often orphaned children now in their care. I wish the war ends and we go back to our relatives and our home and that's it. Ten-year-old Razan Shabbat lost her parents, two siblings and other members of her extended family in an Israeli airstrike. A lot of children who come here, we don't know their names and we write unknown on their entry files until someone comes and recognizes them, including the patient you mentioned her earlier, Razan Samir Shabbat. She was unknown for days and days in the cardiac ICU until a relative came and recognized her. But the strikes keep coming, filling streets with smoke and debris and leaving Palestinians without homes and increasingly hope. In the day's other headlines, cheaper gas helped ease inflation in November. The Labor Department's Consumer Price Index edged up just one-tenth of a percent last month from October. On a year-to-year -year basis, the rate dropped slightly to 3.1 percent from the previous November. The core inflation rate, excluding volatile food and energy costs, rose three-tenths of a percent. That's a bit faster than in October. House Republicans moved today to set a vote on formalizing their impeachment inquiry into President Biden. The focus is whether he benefited from family business dealings, but so far there is no evidence tying him to wrongdoing. Republicans argued today the resolution would give them stronger legal backing for subpoenas. Democrats said it's all a political stunt. They spoke at separate briefings. To fulfill our constitutional responsibility, we have to take the next step. We're not making a political decision. It's not. It's a legal decision. So people have feelings about it one way or the other. We can't prejudge the outcome. The Constitution does not permit us to do so. We have to follow the truth where it takes us. The vote this week is the culmination of the extreme MAGA Republican year-long agenda exacting political retribution on behalf of Donald Trump. It's painfully obvious that they are trying to hurt President Biden politically to help President Trump get reelected. With a closely divided House, the resolution would need near total Republican support. The vote could come tomorrow. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley gets a key endorsement in New Hampshire tonight, six weeks before that state's primary. Governor Chris Sununu is expected to come out for Haley. He's been a vocal critic of former President Donald Trump. Polls show Mr. Trump leading by wide margins in New Hampshire. Claudine Gay will stay as president of Harvard after a backlash over her congressional testimony on campus anti-Semitism. The university's governing body issued a statement today saying, quote, President Gay is the right leader to help our community heal and to address the very serious societal issues we are facing. 
At a House hearing last week, Gay and other school leaders struggled to answer questions from Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. Today, Stefanik had fresh criticism. This is a moral failure of Harvard's leadership and higher education leadership at the highest levels. And the only change they have made to their code of conduct, where they failed to condemn calls for genocide of the Jewish people, the only update to the code of conduct is to allow a plagiarist as the president of Harvard. Harvard's governing body says an independent review of plagiarism allegations against Gay found no violation of school standards. In Pakistan, a suicide bomber blew himself up at a police station today, killing at least 23 people. A Taliban offshoot claimed responsibility. The attack in the northwestern part of that country was one of the deadliest in recent months. The force of the blast shattered windows, damaged nearby businesses, and wounded dozens of people. Pakistan's military said other militants triggered an hours-long shootout before they were killed. Back in this country, Google will appeal a federal jury verdict in San Francisco that found its Android app store operates as an illegal monopoly. Epic Games argued the system quashes competitors and ultimately hurts smartphone users. The judge will now determine what steps Google must take but the appeals process could take years. And on Wall Street, stocks advanced again on the inflation report and ahead of tomorrow's Federal Reserve statement on interest rates. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 173 points to close at 36,578. The Nasdaq rose 101 points. The S&P 500 added 21. Still to come on the news hour, the latest global climate conference faces criticism for its tepid progress. Hip-hop mogul Sean Diddy Combs faces sexual assault lawsuits made possible by a new state law. How the Israel-Hamas war is affecting Hanukkah celebrations here in the U.S. And what Shohei Otani's record-breaking contract means for Major League Baseball. This is the PBS NewsHour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. As the United Nations Climate Conference, known as COP28, comes to a close in Dubai, countries are racing against the clock. More than 100 countries, including the U.S., the U.K., and Australia, are pushing for a firm commitment to stop the use of coal, oil, and gas after earlier drafts advocated for eventually phasing out fossil fuels. Michael Mann has been among those climate experts critical of what's happened at this summit. He's the director of the Penn Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media at the University of Pennsylvania. His new book is Our Fragile Moment, How Lessons from Earth's Past Can Help Us Survive the Climate Crisis. Michael Mann, welcome back to the News Hour. Uh, thanks, Jeff. It's good to be with you. You co-wrote an op-ed in the LA Times saying that not only has COP28 failed to meet this moment demanding dramatic and immediate climate action, it has made a caricature of it. In what ways? Well, okay, first of all, the host country, uh, United Arab Emirates, is a fossil fuel state. It's a petro state. And the president of COP28, uh, appointed by the host uh, is in fact an oil executive. And so there were reasons to be um, skeptical from the very start, uh, given just those plain facts. And everything we've seen since, uh, the fact that, again, the, the president of COP28 uh, has been using language um, claiming that uh, there's no science to back up the need to phase out fossil fuels when, of course, the science overwhelmingly indicates we have to bring carbon emissions down dramatically to avert catastrophic warming. And he even used climate denier tropes like we will all be back in the caves if we make a clean energy transition. And so the fact that we haven't seen much progress, we've seen other petro states like Saudi Arabia now say that there's no way that they will agree to uh, language to phase out fossil fuels. In fact, they won't even agree to language to phase down, whatever that means, uh, to phase down fossil fuels. And so there's a lot of pessimism right now that uh, a few bad apples uh, are, are spoiling the possibility of a meaningful agreement as this window of opportunity is closing. If we don't see progress now, it becomes increasingly difficult to see a way to keep warming below a catastrophic three degrees Fahrenheit. And yet these COP summits, they're the only venue for global climate change negotiations. So what's a better path forward? What reforms are needed? 
Yeah, that's right. And so we resist, you know, uh, calls uh, to dissolve uh, the entire COP process, because as you just said, it is the only multilateral framework we have for global climate negotiations. And polluters would like nothing more than to see the UN Conference of the Parties disappear. What we do need is to mend it, not end it. Uh, we argue, for example, that we can't uh, allow a, um, you know, a single country like Saudi Arabia to prevent uh, the, the, the agreement um, you know, from, from passing. And so there should be something instead like a supermajority. 75% of participating countries have to agree uh, to um, a, a particular resolution for it to pass. But you can't have a system where one bad actor like Saudi Arabia can block any progress at, at all. That's where we are right now. And there need to be penalties. In the past, the enforcement mechanism was called name and shame. For countries who don't make a good faith effort to participate in the negotiations, you call them out, you try to shame them. But some of these countries like Saudi Arabia have shown they have no shame. And so there need to be real penalties for bad actors who uh, essentially are trying to prevent any meaningful progress from taking place. Understanding that critics have make the, they made the point that oil interests have co-opted COP, there are any number of countries who say that completely phasing out fossil fuels uh, hurts them economically and puts them at a disadvantage. Do they have a point? Well, you know, uh, we no longer, uh, you know, kill whales for whale oil because something better came along. Uh, that was fossil fuels two centuries ago. And now something else has come along. Something better has come along, clean energy. What we need to do is to provide the incentives for developing countries to leapfrog past the fossil fuel stage of their economic development. We can't afford for them to make the same mistakes we made. So we've got to pro provide assistance to help developing countries you know, develop clean energy infrastructure. It's win-win. Clean energy um, you know, means a better planet, a better environment, uh, more jobs. Uh, there are far more jobs available in clean energy installation than there are in the largely automated fossil fuel industry. And we also know that um, petro states tend to be authoritative states, um, anti-democratic uh, countries. And so, you know, all of the things that we would like to see, more widespread democracy, a cleaner environment, uh, good jobs, clean jobs uh, for people, all of that is favored by a proactive effort to transition. We're not talking about, you know, uh, sort of stopping all fossil fuel production, uh, uh, you know, uh, cold turkey. What we're talking about is a steady transition, bringing carbon emissions down 50 percent this decade, bringing them down to zero by mid-century. And we have the technology to do that renewable energy, solar, wind, geothermal. We don't need new technology. We just need the political will to make this transition. Michael Mann, thanks as always for your insights. Thank you. An investigation into Chinese fishing fleets and processing centers has discovered that seafood produced with forced labor is making its way to American dinner tables. That's despite a U.S. ban on imports made by workers from China's Xinjiang province. The region in northwest China is home to Muslim minority Uyghurs who have been the victims of well-documented human rights violations. John Yang has more. If you buy frozen seafood at the grocery store or order fish at a chain restaurant, chances are pretty good that it was caught by a Chinese fishing vessel or processed in a Chinese plant. China runs what may be the largest maritime operation ever known. An investigation by the not-for-profit journalism organization called the Outlaw Ocean Project has documented human rights, labor, and environmental concerns related to the Chinese fleet. As Outlaw Ocean founder Ian Urbina tells us in this excerpt from the group's reporting, Chinese fishing ships rely on forced labor. Foreign journalists are generally forbidden from reporting in Xinjiang. So the team of investigators had to rely on a range of publicly available materials, including company newsletters, local news reports, trade data, satellite imagery, and social media. But the real kind of 
key of our investigation um, became the use of the Chinese version of TikTok, which is called Douyin. Videos posted by Uyghurs from seafood plants show that many live in military-style dormitories under the watch of security personnel. Uyghur workers' dorms are often searched, and if a Quran or other contraband is found, the owner may be sent to a re-education camp. Uyghurs' social media posts are also closely monitored by Chinese online censors. Posting anything critical of the regime could quickly land them in a detention center. But it appears that many Uyghurs have found a way to include cryptic messages in their videos to convey their suffering, while also bypassing the Chinese censors. Thousands of tons of seafood processed in China with forced labor continue to enter the United States and Europe. Importers sent their products to major supermarkets around the world, including Walmart, Kroger, Tesco, and Carrefour. The importers also sent seafood to Cisco, the global food service giant that supplies more than 400,000 restaurants in the U.S. alone. Over the past five years, the U.S. government spent more than $200 million to buy seafood from importers linked to Uyghur labor for use in military bases, federal prisons, and public schools. This investigation represents four years of work by Ian Urbina, the executive editor of the Outlaw Ocean Project. And how did you find that this, this labor, the, putting the Uyghurs to work in these processing plants sort of fit in in the Chinese overall strategy in dealing with the Uyghurs? The Uyghurs are uh, a Muslim minority uh, in China. Yeah, I mean, you know, th there's this general policy from the Chinese government to try to relocate many of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and disperse them elsewhere in the country to sort of pacify the population, if you will. Uh, so there's a huge state-run labor transfer program with thousands of Uyghurs that are forcibly removed from this inland province, Xinjiang, and transported 2,000 miles away to the other side of the country to work in the factories. And it's all part of an effort to sort of bring this restive province uh, under control. Ian, you talked to about more than two dozen of the crew members, people who worked on these ships. What did they tell you about the conditions they worked under and the conditions of their employment? Yeah, I mean, we found a lot of forced labor uh, and trafficked labor. Before COVID, a lot of these workers are Indonesian. After COVID, largely rural Chinese. They're pretty nervous to talk openly when we were on board, but you could see the conditions. There are a lot of reports of violence on board and neglect, uh, severe neglect. And these ships often don't return to port for two years, stay at sea for two years. How did you manage to talk to these people? Yeah, it was a process. Um, you know, typically it takes several days just to get out to the fishing grounds or on the high seas. Uh, once we're out there, we make radio contact with the captain. We try to warm the captain up and see if he'll let us on board. If not, uh, oftentimes the ships would flee and we'd get in board a, a faster boat called a skiff and follow the fishing ships. And in those cases, we'd put messages in a bottle uh, asking questions of the crew in Bahasa, Indonesian, or Chinese uh, and English, and, and throw the bottles onto the back of the ship and then follow them until the crew threw the bottles back with answers. And, and not only answers, but some of them asking for help, some of them giving you phone numbers. Yeah, the, the most useful thing were the phone numbers because uh, then we could contact families back home in Indonesia or China and ask those families how long they'd been gone and sort of what they knew of their lost family. You also found uh, violations of law in the way they fished and also uh, environmental violations. Yeah, um, many cases of, you know, shark finning, of uh, invasions of sovereignty. So this is a huge fleet, and often these vessels are aggressively going into waters where they're forbidden, Argentinian, Chilean, Ecuadorian waters where they're not allowed. Uh, so we documented those cases just to show how pervasive the problem is. And how are they able to escape enforcement and escape inspection and that sort of thing? You know, these vessels largely are on the high seas, and this is an area that's very hard to get to. The vessels are in constant motion, and most countries around the world don't have navies out there patrolling their own waters, much less the high seas. So these are working places that are largely out of reach of governments, and that's why they can do as they please. And there were also signs that these ships were doing more than fishing, or fishing for, for other things in a way. Yeah, I mean, you know, China's fishing fleet is in many ways 
um, sort of a, a arm of its geopolitical agenda. It's sort of a projection of power. And so if you look at places like the South China Sea, uh, contested waters in that area, the, the fishing fleet is essentially acting as a civilian militia. And you have enough fishing vessels there that they can crowd around other uh, countries' vessels and crowd around islands that are in contested waters and sort of establish sovereignty and show muscle. It's an ambitious project, and you found it some very interesting things. Now, where can people read and, and, and see your reporting? With The New Yorker on their website. Very good. Ian Urbina, the founder and executive editor of the Outlaw Ocean Project. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Four women are suing hip-hop mogul Sean Diddy Combs over sexual assault allegations dating back to the early 90s. Previously, those lawsuits couldn't have been filed because of the statute of limitations. But most were filed under a New York state law that allowed survivors a one-year window to sue for past abuse. About 3,000 civil lawsuits were filed under the law before its deadline last month. Joining me now is attorney Marianne Wong. She's represented multiple clients seeking justice for sexual crimes both before and after this New York law, and NPR music correspondent Sydney Madden. Thank you both for joining us. So, Marianne, 3,000 civil lawsuits before that legal deadline closed. Tell us what you were seeing in your practice as that deadline approached. What kind of inquiries you were fielding? We were fielding dozens and dozens in the final days, um, sometimes even in the final hours. Um, but throughout the year, uh, as there was more awareness of the opening, uh, I spoke to probably hundreds of women, mostly women, uh, who had been victims of s very serious trauma and rape and sexual assault many years before and who were finally in a place in their lives where they had processed it and were actually able to speak about it to somebody and who, who wanted to do something. And that is precisely the importance of these laws because the trauma that is uh, that is perpetrated on women during sexual assaults and afterwards, uh, it really takes an enormous amount of time for people to process. Obviously, this got a lot of attention because of some of the celebrity names we're talking about here. But Marianne, we know most of the women and most of the uh, accused here are not celebrities. Just paint us a, a portrait of, of your clients and their circumstances. Yeah, so many of them are uh, very vulnerable people to begin with as young women or as women who don't have any resources, who are preyed upon by those with a lot more resources or people in relative power. So employers or members of institutions, there are people who, you know, suffered in foster care or uh, later in life, people who are incarcerated, who were assaulted by guards and others. Um, and those types of people are often the most vulnerable and have very little ability to even first understand how harmed they are and then over the years understand that they actually might have the ability to hold somebody to account. Uh, and so it just takes a very long time before people understand that. Sydney, we know one of those lawsuits was filed by R&B singer Cassandra Ventura. She's known as Cassie, the former girlfriend of Sean Diddy Combs. Why did this one case get so much attention? The tidal wave of allegations really started with the case that was filed by, as you said, Cassie Ventura, who was Diddy's not only longtime partner, romantic partner, but also one of his employees at Bad Boy Entertainment. And this was really big news in the hip hop space and beyond for a few key reasons. First of all, the severity of the allegations were utterly shocking. In the civil suit that Cassie filed, she detailed almost a decade of psychological and physical abuse, uh, moments where he had complete control over her life, coercion. She even alleged that he raped her in her own home towards the end of their relationship, and that he once blew up the car of a man who was interested in Cassie. So the details of this case filing were absolutely explosive, um, no pun intended there. But then also another factor is the stature of Diddy overall. This is a man who's been ubiquitous in the hip-hop and music space for 
over 30 years at this point. He's credited with making the careers of people like Notorious B.I.G. and Mary J. Blige. And even now, he is one of hip hop's billionaires. He's someone who's skyrocketed in not only the music space, but wine and spirits, restauranturing, media, with his own company, Revolt Entertainment. And so he's someone who's one of the most well-connected, influential, and richest people, definitely a power player in the space. So to hear of these allegations and these indiscretions was a big shock. And Sydney, as you know, Cassie's case was settled out of court relatively quickly, but she wasn't the only one to come forward. Three other women have come forward, one of whom was a minor at the time of her alleged abuse. As you said, Diddy is one of the most powerful people in this space, though. When you look at this, is this a moment of a larger reckoning in the industry, or is that going too far? It's an interesting question and one that has been circling around a lot of hip hop spaces right now. Um, as we were talking about, this is one of many cases that have been filed. There were also civil suits filed against former record exec L.A. Reid, another record exec Jimmy Iovine, also two very powerful people in the music space. And so it is definitely ringing back to conversations of a Me Too reckoning. And it's a crucial turning point that we could be having right now, but I do think it is a bit too early to tell. Um, so it's a yes and no. There are a lot of big events that are coming up that will determine where Diddy and others lie in terms of their own cultural capital. Things like the Grammys, which Diddy is nominated in the 2024 ceremony upcoming. That's when we'll really see the power of his proximity, the power of his bank account, and how people relate to him and align with him going forward. Marianne, meanwhile, all these other many, many women are searching for justice in their cases. The, the deadline for this Adult Survivors Act has now passed. So, so, so now what? What happens with those cases? What happens with anyone else who wants to come forward with a case from long ago? Well, I think the most important thing to tell any survivor is that if they think they could have a pro case or they, they've been hurt and they want to seek justice, they should try to learn about what their legal rights, because the le legal landscape is actually fairly complicated and it depends on when the assaults happened as to whether or not you have a live claim. But the fact of the matter is having a time limit to immediately file a lawsuit after you've either been controlled by and or abused for years sometimes uh, by a perpetrator. Um, it's something that takes years to understand and get, get healthy from and get to a place where you actually feel like maybe you can, uh, can pursue something and can face this perpetrator again in court. Um, it's not an easy thing. And I think, um, you know, the, the public and um, the legislators should understand that, and that should be reflected in extending or even eliminating statutes of limitations. That is attorney Marianne Wong and NPR music correspondent Sydney Madden joining us tonight. Thank you to you both. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Amna. While many Jewish Americans are celebrating Hanukkah this week, some of the festivities are being tempered by the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas and concerns closer to home of anti-Semitism. We spoke with people across the country about what Hanukkah means to them and if they're celebrating it differently this year. I'm Rebecca Lowen. My name is David Berenson, and I'm from the Cleveland area. I am Rabbi Jill Perlman, and I serve as the senior rabbi at Temple Isaiah in Lafayette, California. My name is Gadi Peleg, and I'm the founder and owner of Bread's Bakery in New York City. My name is Mark Baker. I'm the president and CEO of Combined Jewish Philanthropies. The Hanukkah holiday feels incredibly poignant and in some ways too relevant this year. Hanukkah, first and foremost, is a story about resistance. Um, it's about our willingness to stand up and fight against people who would try to do us harm. Um, and it's a story about the courage to overcome. Certainly in our synagogue, and I know in synagogues across the country, we'll, we'll be holding close uh, the over 130 hostages that are still being held in Gaza. We are hoping and praying for uh, peace in the region and that all who are suffering, the innocent who are suffering in Gaza, in Israel, that that suffering is able to come to an end and we're able to find a solution that will be one in which all will ultimately be at peace.
I run a Jewish-focused lifestyle blog. So I recently had a post take off on Instagram about how to celebrate in this year, given everything that's going on, um, both in the Middle East, again, and here at home with the rise of anti-Semitism. Moses said it best. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your children may live. So go ahead and host, celebrate, decorate, bake cupcakes with tiny potatoes on them. Whatever you do, just don't do it lightly. So I think one reason why the video went viral is that people within the Jewish community are looking for that permission to resume normal life and to celebrate this holiday that we all love so much and to do it with, with some joy in our hearts. It is, of course, the celebration of the miracle of the oil. And that miracle is celebrated by eating sufganyot, that are jelly donuts, and latkes. We are seeing a huge demand for all of our Hanukkah items as people are eager to celebrate this holiday, which has particular importance and particular meaning this year. We need to come together um, as a community and publicly to say we're proud of who we are and uh, nothing's gonna get in the way of us um, celebrating our tradition and our past and our stories. We have family coming in from out of town that we don't always have around Hanukkah. I don't know what to anticipate with our family discussions this year. I, I'm kind of looking forward to it, even though it may be challenging at a time because you get 10 people together in a room and you get 15 different perspectives. We can hold multiple emotions and, and multiple um, reactions to what is happening at the same time. There is, uh, there is sadness and, uh, and even some despair over the ongoing war in Israel and in Gaza. But we're also going to continue to hold on to hope and make sure that we are, are finding the joy of this holiday and the joy of, of just what it means to be alive each and every day. Major League Baseball's Shohei Otani is heading to the L.A. Dodgers. His new home stadium is only about 30 miles north of where he currently plays with the Los Angeles Angels, but that small move is coming with a big paycheck. Otani's record-breaking $700 million 10-year contract recognizes his value as a unique baseball talent, the likes of which we haven't seen in generations. Stephanie Sai looks at the Otani phenomenon, his massive contract, and what it could mean for baseball. Shohei Otani's contract is the highest in professional team sports in North America. Otani blew by a recent record set by Kansas City Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes by a good $250 million. The 29-year-old from Japan dominates in both pitching and hitting. He was the league's most valuable player this past season. I'm joined now by Joe Posnanski, a sports writer who's on Substack under Joe Blogs and author of Why We Love Baseball. So, Joe, how great is Otani? Is he baseball's GOAT, the best player the sport's ever seen? Well, it's, it's early a little bit to call him the greatest who ever played. But what I think you can definitely say about him is nobody has ever been like him. Uh, he is unlike anybody. We've never seen a player who both is a dominant hitter and a dominant pitcher at the same time. Uh, it has happened in the past. Babe Ruth started his career as a pitcher. Uh, but by the time he hit, he, he had left pitching behind. To see what Shohei Otani has done the last three years has been just remarkable. Otani said in his announcement that until the last day of his playing career, he wants to strive forward, not only for the Dodgers, but for the baseball world. Why is Otani and this deal so good for baseball? Well, I, I think it's because he's so good for baseball. I mean, you, you hear in that statement what makes him so special. And, and that is that He's not just playing for himself. He's not just playing for his team. He's not just playing for today. He's playing to be one of the great players who ever lived. And, and it's a part of who he is. It's why he decided to try to hit and pitch. It it's, hasn't been done. It, it simply has not been done. 
it's been something that has driven him to be not only a great player, but one of the greatest and, and one of the players who pushes baseball forward. And obviously it's so good for the sport and it's exciting for the sport to have him with, you know, sort of a marquee team like the Los Angeles Dodgers. Yeah, and I want to get to that team in a second, but you can't be the greatest, right, without a World Series title. And with the Angels, Otani has never even made it to the playoffs. The Dodgers have made it to the playoffs every year for more than a decade. Is that what's in it for him? It certainly is a big part of what's in it for him. Uh, he, You're right. I, I don't think you can be considered the greatest ever if you haven't played in the World Series and thrived in the World Series, done some amazing things in the World Series. It's just sort of a part of, of baseball. And it wasn't happening in, in Anaheim, in Los Angeles for the Angels. Uh, he needed, I think, to go to a team where he could succeed. And and like you say, the Dodgers have not only made the playoffs, they've, they've won 100 games, I believe, five or six times in the last few years. Uh, every year, they're a dominant team, uh, that's got to be very exciting for him, and it's exciting for us. So between Otani, Mookie Betts, and Freddie Freeman, this trio is going to generate a lot of excitement, but that's a colossal amount of pressure to win the World Series. Is there any doubt they can handle that? I don't think there's any doubt they can handle the pressure because all of them, uh, you know, certainly Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman, have been there already. Also, what's really fun about the Dodgers, in, 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 at least from an outsider's perspective, is they face this pressure every single year. There, there's no year where it's good enough even just to win 100 games, just to make the playoffs. The intense pressure is on them to win the World Series every year, and they haven't really done that. They've won one World Series, uh, this group, and that was back in 2020 during the COVID year, so it's, it's a little bit of a different kind of season. So that pressure is always there. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about this contract, but also the fact that Shohei Otani has had um, two surgeries related to his elbow, and I believe has another surgery going in, and he won't be pitching next year. Uh, he'll be hitting, but not pitching. 97% of the actual payout in that contract basically is deferred until he's like 40 years old, about ready to retire. First of all, that's legal, and doesn't that give the Dodgers another advantage to keep paying high salaries to the other great players in the organization? Yeah, I think that had to be a big, big part of it for Otani. It doesn't feel legal to me, honestly. I mean, it is, it's a $700 million contract that doesn't really begin until 2034. So that's it's a very, very strange thing, and, and it's kind of hard to even get your arms around what it means. But... For the Dodgers, it does mean that they can go out, get more pitching, which is what they need right now. And, you know, as far as Otani and the injuries, that had to be a huge part of the decision process because you're right. I mean, as we, as far as we know, he's not going to pitch this year. We don't really know exactly what the surgery has been and, and where his elbow is from a health perspective. You would think the Dodgers have a much better perspective on that than any of us do. But... The thing that's so amazing about Shohei Otani is how driven he is, how driven he is to get better, how driven he is to, as we say, be a part of baseball history. So I'm sure what the Dodgers are betting on is, is that kind of commitment from Shohei Otani. Joe Posnaski, author of Why We Love Baseball. Great to have you. Great to be here. Later tonight on PBS, Frontline presents a film about one of the biggest leaks of government secrets in U.S. history. The Discord Leaks focuses on the more than 300 pages of classified information posted on the chat platform Discord, allegedly by 21-year-old airman Jack Teixeira. In the summer of 2020, Jack graduates high school. That's, of course, the first year of the pandemic. He actually skips high school graduation because he's off to basic training at Lackland Air Force Base. He goes on to start taking the coursework that he needs to become a cyber transport specialist. It was a low-level IT job, but it required a security clearance and a background check. He was a little bit worried they were gonna, in their interview, bring up, hey, we found this Discord account or we found this Discord server. 
At that time, he did become less active in Discord, and he was very worried about keeping the things he was doing private and safe. What was he specifically worried that the background investigation might turn up with regards to Discord? Um, there was a lot of, like, racist talk on that server. There was a lot of talk of killing ATF agents, killing different government officials, committing acts of terrorism, things that are probably not great for someone in the military to be saying. So I think that's probably what he was worried about. But Deshera was investigated and ultimately approved for security clearance by the Department of Defense. One big question we have right now is, how did Jack Deshera get a security clearance? So, I mean, if we're looking at Jack Deshera and all the things that he posted online, the racist, violent comments, the memes, the imagery, and the fact that he ultimately is accused of leaking hundreds of classified documents, it's like, okay, well, wait a minute. There should have been red flags along the way. Frontlines, the Discord leaks, premieres tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern on PBS and on YouTube. And that is the news hour for tonight. I'm Amna Nawaz. And I'm Jeff Bennett. Thanks for joining us and have a good evening. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by Consumer Cellular. This is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Carnegie Corporation of New York. Supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and the advancement of international peace and security at Carnegie.org. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.